Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Spectre. And uh, I've donated some of my time to my revolutionary leader, the youth wing of Kosatu. Uh, seeing that I was, I'm now on the other side of being considered a youth. I've been referred to in some places as being a free agent. Well, I must declare that uh, I consider myself a free citizen, which means very simply that I owe my loyalty to God, which includes my teenage children, to the Constitution and my conscience. So I speak what I want, so get used to it. <laughs> the second is that uh, you know, being in a casino, it's a very appropriate way, place to have a political conversation. Because it gives you a sense of an Alice in Wonderland scenario here. Uh, with some people coming here to promise the lotto miracle that we often see in this country. But um, I actually did meet the fairy godmother while I was at the urinal. And she, she gave me a, 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 she granted me a magic wand that allowed me to have a hundred, hundred wishes made. And so I was, as I was thinking about what I should say here, if I had a hundred wishes, what would I want? You know, understanding that if Sisonka, Buiseka and Fatima ever start a political party, and those should be your first recruits for the political party you're considering, I will certainly become a member of that party. The second is that fighting for, you know, for power and our experience has always been easier than exercising power. So you've got to understand the complexity of politics and the management of economies and politics and aspirations and and the protests that will in eventually come. But what would I focus on? The first I would focus on is education. Fix up education. And here I have a very simple request. <clears throat> Do the job that we pay you for and don't put your hands in the cookie jar. <laughs> this country will be spectacularly successful with no other new policy. Don't steal. Just do the job we pay you for. So what would we do? We put $253 billion into education. I would insist, like the, e, the Equal Education Organization says, that norms and studies should be implemented from tomorrow. What is so difficult about putting a toilet, putting water, putting electricity, a lab, a library in a school? There are only damn 27,000 of them. If we can deliver world-class soccer stadiums, can't we put toilets in a place? <laughs> the second is, we know that we fail in reading and, reading and writing maths and science. Yet we have this ridiculous new law they want to introduce, stopping foreigners coming here. We need to import maths and science teachers, if we have to. The next I would say is that principles Forgive me, my union comrades. Principles are part of management. They should not be allowed to join trade unions. They are responsible for making sure a school works. And we cannot comp compromise that line of authority. <laughs> and then I would insist that any teacher that has any relationship, even consensual with a pupil, should be fired and should be criminally prosecuted and put on a public register of sexual offenders. What would I do about jobs? Because again, it's the fairy, Alice in fairy, Fairyland scenario. Every political party came here and said, we even did that in 1994. And we failed. And we will continue to fail to deliver the five million jobs and the six million jobs it's promises we know they will fail to deliver. Why? Because in the 21st century, things have fundamentally changed. Technology that you all connected as the most connected generation in the history of humanity has changed the way we work, the way we organize our societies, the way we communicate, we access information, education, knowledge, the way we live our lives. We've got to come to terms with that. And what we have is an education system that produces old skills, where I am looking for a job. And what we know today, even in the, 
the developed world that you have all the people that are educated who are still unemployed. The only difference with us is that we are people that come out of 12 years of education with very few skills and are unlikely to have a job in their lifetime. But we're having to face a world where we've got to redefine what we are training people for and what is the role of the state and what is the role of business. And that's about livelihoods. And instead of putting trillions of rand into the traditional BEE, which has created billionaires, I worked as a general secretary in the 1980s with thousands of black businesses under NAFCOC and FAPCOS. Where are those businesses today? Have they become medium? Have they become large? We don't see any evidence that the money we've put into empowering black business has produced productive business people and productive businesses that employ people. And that's something we should start to talk about how we finance the real entrepreneurs who will create real jobs and how do we use government procurement and how do you use the connection to the private sector. Then we have to look at what our assets are. You know, in Africa, and I do a lot of work in Africa, the demographic dividend that faces us in Africa, of the billion people in Africa, half of them are under 19. By 2035, we'll have a workforce larger than that of India or China. By 2050, we are 2 billion people. By the end of the century, half the young people in the world are African. It's our most tremendous resource. We have two-thirds of the remaining arable land in the world where population will rise to 9 billion and need to be fed. We have one-third of the mineral wealth of the world. What do we do? We export raw materials. We export jobs. What do we do with land? We, we give our land to big foreign companies and governments and we export the jobs and our people continue to be hungry. The question we have to ask how do we understand our assets? Combining the demographic dividend of young people and matching that to our assets and making the connection between what we can produce to meet our own needs and what we can continue to do in terms of supplying the world. The, the final thing that I will look at is the budget. The budget is Im almost impossible to grapple with. A trillion rand. Who understands a trillion rand? I expect a few billionaires would understand, but I don't understand it. How can we use our budget to build accountability? Imagine for the 253 billion we spend on education, where our outcomes are worse than most African countries. Imagine if we could break that budget down to what the budget of my school is. How much money is going to teachers? If there's money going for 20 teachers, but there's only 15 teachers, I know someone is stealing it. And me as a parent or a student or a principal or the teachers or the community can have accountability enforced at a local level that technology allows us to do. Let's put power and the tools of technology in the hands of ordinary people. And they will hold those leaders accountable from the bottom upwards. And I think that's what we want to do for the clinics, for the schools, for local government, for services. And I think that finally, one of the things I would like to do is if you want to be in parliament and you want to be a state official, first and foremost, commit that you will have your children in public schools. Commit that you will use public hospitals because most of our political leaders have deserted the public sector and they don't care a damn where it works because they're never going to see it. What would we do around electoral reform? I would go further than just accountability and disclosure. I would ban private sector funding of elections. I would create an institution and that's part of a global commission that is examining this that says that private sector money should not be allowed to interfere in the electoral processes. And that's a debate we've got to have. It can go into a special institution, but the public elections should be funded by public money and no allowance made for any private sector funding of political parties. Thank you. Know more about your world. ENCA.com.